Hi, wonderful students. Welcome to Safety, Security, and Emergency Preparedness. Uh, for this chapter, you will make you will want to make sure you have your textbook available to reference various tables, figures, have enough space to take ample notes. Um, please note we are focusing on the middle age and older adult in block one. Therefore, please skip over the sections specifically listed for pediatrics, children, and adolescents. So again, we're focusing on the adult and the older adult. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Please take a moment to review each one of these. If you can speak to these and apply these to your nursing practice, then you have accomplished your learning for this chapter. Safety and security are basic human needs. Promoting safety and preventing injury are primary responsibilities of the nurse. Factors affecting safety are listed on this slide. Developmental considerations are important to consider when caring for your patients. Falls, burns, poisoning, and automobile accidents are common safety problems among older adults. Exposure to temperature extremes also places older adults at risk for injury or death. Other factors to consider when caring for the, for the elderly include the normal physiological changes that occur with aging, increased incidences of chronic disease and illness, increased use of medications, cognitive or emotional changes, the acuteness of the patient's diminished senses that occurs with aging, for example, vision loss, hearing loss, depth perception is totally changed, um, decreased mobility, decreased flexibility, they are all common and can interfere with the ability of the older adult to judge the distance and height of, say, stairs or curbs. Um, and so, and they also have an altered balance too, right? <clears throat> Changes in vision makes it more difficult to read labels with small print. Sometimes result in, in older adults taking incorrect medications or even wrong dosages, right? Please take a look at your text as it reviews some of the different fall risk precautions, um, including intrinsic, meaning person-based, right? Like poor vision, gait problems, those kinds of things, or extrinsic, like environmentally based, like ha uh, lack of handrails, for example. Physical examination. <clears throat> Be sure to look at your patient head to toe. Your first assessment establishes your patient's baseline um, for that stay, which is very important, right? Other information you want to get is when they're healthy, what is their baseline information, right? So you can compare it to that. Establishing a patient's baseline lets us know when our patients have a change in their status and thus keeps them safe. The sooner we uh, notice a change in their condition and the quicker we can respond to this change that's occurred, the better the outcome for the patient and for their safety. Mobility. Again, ask them how mobile they are at home and if they use any assisted devices like walkers or canes and things like that. Have them show you how they walk. Carry on a conversation with your patient. Ask them specific questions they should know the answers to, such as what's the date, who's the president, um, those kinds of things. <clears throat> that way you can accept, assess their cognition and at the same time you can assess how they verbalize their answers. Do you understand them? Do they have a slur when they speak? All of those things, right? Sensory perception. Touch your patient bilaterally on the upper extremities as well as the lower extremities and ask them if they can feel you touch them equally on both sides. Ask them if they experience numbness in area, any area of their extremities. It's important to assess your patients for abuse. Many times a nurse's assessment may detect signs of abuse or neglect. As nurses, we are mandated reporters, meaning it is our responsibility to report any suspicious behavior um, or abuse or any neglect, right? Suspicion of neglect. Now, I will say each facility has guidelines for what the reporting structure is. So for example, my facility, I would report it to my charge nurse who would then report it on up to the risk management team, right? And then of course they would call it um, adult protective services for the elderly patient who's being abused. 
Um, so see the information on your book about abu um, an abuse assessment screen um, and so that you can know like what we look at for abuse and neglect. Be sure when asking these types of questions to your adult or elderly patients that the individual is alone, as many victims of abuse will not state their true feelings in the presence of their abuser. Um, and if you suspect abuse or neglect, follow, again, follow your facility's guidelines on who to report it to. Developmental considerations that will take into account potential issues with your patients, right? Whether or not they're driving uh, lends their own set of challenges, right? Do they have substance abuse problems or do they have substance use that could alter their neuro status and maybe cause them potential, you know, fall risks and things like that? Do they have firearms? Um, are they on the internet, right? They could be taken advantage of that way. Not all, but you know, neurologically, if they're compromised, if they have dementia or whatever, right? It can, <clears throat> especially in the beginning phases when, you know, um, they get forgetful, they could have um, a scam artist call them and get talk them into buying something that they don't need, right? Again, social media, sex trafficking, drug use, poisoning, um, and it looks like I did the same <laughs> words on this right side. I think it's because it's that important. So just make sure you know them. <clears throat> the functional analysis screening tool. It's a 16 item questionnaire about the anecdotal and consequential events that might, you know, correlate with the occurrence of behavioral problems, right? Items are organized into four functional categories and they're based on contingencies um, that maintain problem behavior. The sensory profile is a standardized tool to help evaluate a child's sensory processing patterns in the context of the home, the school, the community-based activities, those kinds of things. The forms are completed by caregivers and teachers who have observed the child's response to sensory interactions that occur throughout the day. Remember that wet floors, no matter what the reason, can be extremely dangerous. Wet floors are a major contributor to slips and falls where serious injuries are the result. Review these wet floor safety tips with all your employees that work at your facility, the hospital, SNF, ALF, all of that. Slips will um, produce injuries. It could be, you know, slips, they could hit their head. They could end up with, you know, a, a head injury that causes intracranial pressure, which can lead to all kinds of other permanent, it could be even life limiting, right? I've seen patients before who um, slipped and fell, hit their head just right and actually resulted in, you know, them dying a few days later. So it, it's just extremely, extremely important that we prevent any potential for slips and anything that can potentially cause a slip, right, or a fall. Um, <clears throat> so the factors in the physical environment are extremely important to health as, uh, as well as to harmful situations like air pollution or if you live close to a toxic site, right? Um, whether you have access to health care, right? Uh, whether you have access to eating healthy or you only have access to unhealthy foods, right? It's unfortunate, but unhealthy foods are so much cheaper. Do you have access to recreational resources, right? Where you can stay active and, you know, um, or even medical care, right? We, we have, you know, millions and millions of people who don't have access to simple medical care, basic medical care. And then looking at the communities themselves, right? You know, what how is your community what's the built environment do you have excess land or is it building a building upon building upon building are the streets connected do you have transportation systems all of these things will affect your patients when they don't have the resources necessary right um and and this is things that we do consider as nurses as well right we're looking at the the patient holistically so we want to watch out for these home safety hazards, falls, fires, carbon monoxide, choking, cuts, poisoning, strangling, drowning, burns, um, clutter, right? Um, oh my goodness, I could just go on and on. Can you think of a few that I haven't mentioned? Focus your assessment of your patient, look at their environment, ask questions to assess their cognitive limitations, evaluate their strength, 
to assess their physical limitations, look around the room to recognize potential risks. For example, when walking into an older patient's room, look to be sure everything is picked up off the floor. Look to see what they use for mobility. If you don't see anything, ask them how they get around, like to use a walker, right, or a cane or a wheelchair. Ask the patient to demonstrate how they walk using that um, DME, durable medical equipment, right? So you can assess any weakness or postural changes when they're walking. Check the floor for rugs. These are all interventions to avoid potential falls, right? When speaking to patients, take note, does one side of their face droop or do they slur their speech when um, speaking? These could be signs that your patient is at risk for aspiration and or choking. Please take a look in your task, text again for home safety checklists. It discuss really great examples <clears throat> for these um, you know, safety hazards. Collecting a history from the patient is important as it will inform you as, as their nurse to know what risks this patient may present. Be sure your patient is a good historian. For example, if they have a diagnosis of dementia, be sure to follow up on the patient's answers with a family member that they live with, a caregiver that they live with, and or the medical power of attorney to ensure the accuracy of what the patient's telling you, right? When doing the assessment, Ask open-ended questions and get your patient talking, right? So open-ended questions are not simple answers, right? So an open-ended question is going to require them to say more than two words. It's going to require them to explain in detail a situation. A closed-ended question is a yes-no question. Um, are you able to ambulate? Yes. Right. Ask them um, to show you how to use their you know, PPE, right? And be alert of any history that may be a potential risk to a change in their health, such as drug or alcohol abuse. Ask them when is the last time that they took their last drink or took their last drug, right? And you'll be surprised, but a lot of, you know, many of the patients and most of them will be honest with you, right? When they're doing drugs or drinking alcohol, right? It's only in their best interest so we can manage them, especially alcohol. If alcoholics try to stop drinking um, abruptly, they can go in uh, DTs and it can kill them. So it's very important that we not, um, that we ensure that they are open with their communication. We got to educate them on those kinds of things. Um, let's see. It's important to gain an understanding of withdrawal or potential increased risk to drug overdose if you're planning to administer, you know, pain medications and things like that. It's important as the nurse to approach your patient in a very non judgmental way and provide a very welcoming environment. This way, your patient will feel, you know, they will trust you and will be a true historian of what they're currently doing as far as drugs, alcohol, and, and the like. Okay, factors that contribute to falls. There is a lot of great tables in our book about these, about this topic. Um, so take a look at that. The physical factors will become evident uh, throughout your assessment as listed on this slide. Be sure to make note of physical limitations or cognitive limitations that can lead to an unsteady gait or balance issue that may put your patient at a higher risk for falls. Additionally, poor vision, comorbidities, use of medications that can increase risk fall, orthostatic hypotension, if they have a vitamin D deficiency, if they have problems with their feet, uh, which may include open wounds or even, even numbness, right, can, can be really high risk factors for falls. What diagnoses can you think of that may include these risk factors? Our diabetic patients can sometimes have all of these. When you assess your patient's gait, take note of dizziness upon standing. I always tell my patients to be sure to stand slowly and be sure that they have their balance before taking a step. I literally will tell them to stand up and just stand there for a good 30 seconds before they start to move, right? Gives the body time to even out the blood pressure before they take off walking. Um, so let's see. And then in the home, be sure to assess for clutter, ill-fitting shoes, um, slippers, 
any kind of problems at all that could potentially cause your patient to fall, right? And then also when working with patients, be sure to look at their medications so that you can, you know, see if they're on any kind of psychoactive drugs, narcotics, benzo uh, benzodiazepines, opioids, all of these things that can really impair judgment and increase risk falls. That way, if you're aware that they're on these meds, then you'll just educate them about, you know, the heightened risk. <clears throat> Risk factor assessments. Again, your book has a great home safety checklist. So uh, again, pause the video, go there and read about it. Um, be aware of both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Remember, intrinsic risk factors are person-based factors, such as you know a history of previous falls. Maybe they have um, unsteady gaits, poor vision, postural hypotension, etc. Whereas extrinsic risk factors are environmentally based such as lack of handrails there's clutter on the floor they have slippery surfaces there's obstacles they have throw rugs all of these things you know that need to be getting rid of uh, one thing i look for when doing my home visits is throw rugs i can't i can't express to you how throw rugs can create a tripping hazard when doing a home assessment look to be sure that the home has fire and smoke detectors and be sure they are working and not have not been disconnected you'd be surprised how many people disconnect them because they get tired of having to replace the batteries many people um, in Arizona specifically we need to be aware of water and drowning right drowning is a big problem in Arizona and with the heat index now being um, just over the top dehydration is even more a problem so staying hydrated so having plenty of water to drink um, and then also just being clearly aware that we have lots of pools in arizona um, just because the family doesn't have a pool doesn't mean that we don't need to do water education and safety with our uh, patients and their you know family members because friends and relatives and you know a lot of people have pools so it, honestly it's very important that we Never assume as a nurse that um, they don't need the education. We always, um, you know, educate our patients if there's ever a risk, right? And always ask the patient about, you know, they're the best historian, right? So you want to definitely get the background from them. From them. <clears throat> Another area of education may be firearm safety. If a firearm is kept in the home, it really is imperative that it is stored properly, right? So that um, it's not accidentally fired and kills someone. All right, patient outcomes for safety. So, okay, so far we have discussed um, on assessment, we have discussed some interventions and patient education, patient teaching. So now we are going to look at our outcomes identification and planning. Setting our goals is important so that we have measures to evaluate. This slide, this slide shows some expected outcomes for patients that promote safety and prevent injury. Once the goals are set and our patients and caregivers understand and are in agreement with them, we can then move into implementation. Once we have an agreed upon goal and implemented them, then we can evaluate the goal um, at our next visit with the patient. Safety devices to prevent falls. One safety device used in facilities to prevent falls are bedside rails. Bedside rails keep patients in the twin size bed as not all people are used to sleeping in a small twin bed. Keeping the upper bed rails up will help remind them where the edge of the bed is. All beds should be um, kept locked uh, the majority of the time, definitely when they're stored, right? The only times we unlock the bed and and the only time we put up all four of the rails is when we are transporting the patient from uh, one place to another, like for a procedure, right? Um, <clears throat> or from another facility to another, right? Otherwise, the bed is locked and the bottom two rails are not left up. Um, let's see. Where I work at night, we put bed alarms on everyone on, on my floor, as nighttime seems to be an area of vulnerability with increased falls. This is due to a variety of reasons, including, but not limited to, the patients are in a new environment, the lighting in the room is low, right, so they can sleep, but that does increase the fall risk. We use all kinds of neuro-altering meds, right, like benzos or opioids, right? Um, 
And even if patients are alert and oriented, they have no mobility and have no mobility issues, they can still become disoriented at night, waking up in a strange room in a strange place, you know, with all these different machines and things. So that so putting these extra precautions in place only makes sense, right? In addition to these, we put, um, as you can see in the picture, non-slip socks are placed on every single patient in the hospital. Um, and we have bright yellow colors for our, our high risk fall patients, right? So it lets staff know early on that that patient's at risk for falling, right? So never to ambulate alone. Uh, safety considerations for adults. Okay, at this stage, reinforcement of healthy lifestyles, healthy behaviors, and literally making good choices are really important. So you wanna assess for stress and occupational hazards, right? And we wanna provide our patients with resources for coping mechanisms or self-help groups if needed. You're gonna assess for substance abuse, you're gonna assess for smoking, and we're gonna provide resources for rehabilitation, counseling, smoking, sensation, all of those things. Help is available, it is important to address the patient's issues and provide appropriate resources for help in changing unhealthy behaviors. And remember, we also have our social workers in our facilities and uh, settings that can help with gathering resources too for the patients. There are different types of ambulation alarms if the bed alarm is not sufficient in alerting of your patient's movement. Where I work, we have a belt that lays across the patient that does not restrain the patient in any way, but is very sensitive to movement, thus alerting us um, if the patient tries to even get up, right? It actually alerts us if, if they even move, right? So this will help prevent falls because then we come running in and we get the patient before they start trying to get out of bed. Another type of alarm we use is a pressure sensitive chair or bed pad alarm and that literally gets put under the patient and when they move and the pressure is relieved the pad alarms and then that we know to go to that patient and check that patient out to make sure they're okay. Safety considerations again for the older adult. Most accidents that involved older adults are preventable. Environmental hazards place a large role in falls. Adjusting the, adjusting the patient's environment to reduce clutter, to reduce obstacles, to reduce rugs, this all helps um, with proper mobility aids. Um, <clears throat> for example, if, um, if they're weak, we wanna make sure they have the proper durable medical, medical equipment, DME, right, to help with that. If they have an unsteady gait, decreased sensory abilities, maybe their, um, the, well, their reflexes are definitely gonna be slower, their reaction times are gonna be slower, all of these things, when we take them into consideration, we can minimize or even eliminate their risks by being proactive, right? Um, so, for example, making sure the patient gets regular hearing and regular vision screens, right, to assess if they have any sensory deficits. That way we can catch it as soon as the, you know, the hearing or the seeing starts to deteriorate and get them glasses or hearing aids, whatever it is, to keep them safe. It's important to educate this population as well on medical administration, as many older adults are on several medications and if not taken properly, um, through either non-compliance or maybe they take too much. Um, this can actually cause dizziness, drowsiness, injury, and sometimes even death, right? So it's important we look at that. All right, if your patient does fall and hit their head, there are certain um, physical indicators that we look for when we're doing our assessment that could um, prompt us doing further testing, right? So physically, if the patient has a headache, if they're vomiting, if there's any problems with balance, fatigue, if they're dazed or stunned appearance, remember it could be indicative of intracranial pressure, which is what happens when there's an injury to that area, right? Remember inflammation happens at the site. And remember the cranium is a contained space. There's not a lot of area in there for inflammation to occur. If it occurs too much, what happens? Well, the brain has nowhere to go. So what does it do? It herniates and then the patient dies, right? Cognitive, so again, if they're mentally foggy, no, this patient was alert and oriented times four, they hit their head and now they're having difficult concentrating, they're having, they're confused, right? All of these are huge. 
Oh, and then emotional. Oh my goodness, if they're irritable or nervous or very emotional, that's a big indication that they're having some ICP in there, intracranial pressure. And then of course, remember the whole thing about don't let them go to sleep. It's a true thing with concussions, right? So um, drowsiness and that kind of thing. And then ironically, they could actually have the opposite problem where they can't fall asleep even though they've been awake for 36 hours, right? So these are all things we're gonna look at when we're looking at um, head injuries. Dang it, I went too fast. Let me make sure I didn't go too fast. Okay, there we go. Okay, safety improvement strategies. Okay, the Joint Commission has mandated that all accredited healthcare organizations across the United States reduce the risk of harm to patients resulting from falls. According to the Joint Commission, approximately 35% of patients who fall sustain injuries. Medicare has identified falls as a never ever ever event meaning they are preventable and should never occur therefore medicare has limited the amount of reimbursement reimbursement they will give for falls and the resulting care that has to be done um, so that's bad news for the um, hospitals right and the locations the SNFs, the alps all of that this slide lists tools designed to help healthcare organizations reduce falls. These toolkits are available online and include solutions for preventing falls, staffing, training materials, fall reduction policies, all of these to help organizations monitor the how, when, where, all of that, as well as tracking like where did the injury happen? What type of fall was it? What prevention strategies were used? All of that, you know, as well as measuring genuinely the root cause of what caused that specific um, accident, right? Um, that fall. So they use these tools to study health related adverse events, as well as close calls to find out what happened, why it happened, but most importantly, how can we prevent it from happening again in the future? The Hendrick Two Fall Risk Model is a simple evaluation tool to help healthcare organizations identify patients at risk for falling. It evaluates eight independent risk factors. Uh, the Get Up and Go test measures the person's ability to stand from a seated position. The Morse Fall Scale is a tool used in Banner Hospitals and other organizations to identify high fall risk patients. Fall scene investigations are done as performance improvement strategies to prevent falls. This strategy uses a fall prevention team that analyzes each fall, then implements new initiatives to avoid any future falls. In the hospital, hourly patient rounding is an expected responsibility of nursing, realizing that the more frequent rounding may be required when caring for a patient who is a high fall risk, right? So, it is expected we go in hourly and more frequently if we have, you know, the yellow band high, high fall risk patients. And if possible, we try to move those these patients that are high fall risks closer to the nurses stations. We can keep a better eye on them. All right, another safety piece is Another safety piece is the RACE um, acronym. So this is if you have a fire in your facility, the first thing you're going to do is rescue the individual that's in the room where the fire is at. Of course, this is only if it's safe to do so. Then the next step you do once that person's out of the room is you're going to push the uh fire code or the, you know, uh, yeah, fire code on the wall or call 911 if they don't have a fire code, if it's like a long-term care facility. Uh, the next thing you're going to do, C, is to confine the fire. And then you're going to, um, you know, we're going to talk about the um, pulling the pin, uh, you know, the pass safety criteria for the fire extinguisher. So C is confine the fire by closing the doors and windows. Remember, fires spread by consuming oxygen. It's their life, blood, right? Oxygen. So we want to confine the fire by closing the doors and then, of course, uh, putting the fire out by pulling the pin on the extinguisher and um, putting it out, right? And then while you're doing that, E is going to be there evacuating the rest of the patients <clears throat> out of the hospital, making them safe, right? Okay, so the next thing after this is pass. 
This is what you do for the fire extinguisher. First thing you do is pull the pin out of the fire extinguisher. You're gonna aim the hose of the fire extinguisher at the base of the fire. People forget it's the base, not the top where the flames are, but the actual base of the fire, right? Because that's where it's stemming from. That's the life, life hood of the, of the fire. Then you're gonna squeeze the handle together on uh, gripping the fire extinguisher and you're going to literally sweep side to side to put the fire out. So again, uh, facility safety, you need to know the, pro the fire protocols, you need to know um, the alarm system, right? And um, please don't turn down the alarm systems <laughs> because they're annoying you because we only use them when it's a true emergency or a fire drill. And we need all of that to make sure that we're prepared, right? You need to make sure that uh, the equipment we have is not broken down, that the fire extinguishers are full, um, and that they're not expired, those kinds of things, right? Um, be aware of any type of metals or, you know, MRI machines and all those kinds of things and what we should do when it comes to fires for that. Um, and then, of course, you want to file a safety event report if, um, you know, if an incident occurs. Okay, safety event report. So we have, <clears throat> we have these forms or reports that are done um, on a separate form, and of course, they're not put in the patient's uh, medical chart, right? Uh, documentation is dependent upon the type of event that you are reporting on, and these reports are always done for any type of, of adverse event or incident that happens with your patient. But again, it doesn't go in the patient's chart. Um, we also do them for adverse events uh, that happen due to procedures not followed, due to employee conflict, those kinds of things. Uh, where I work, these reports are discussed in a hospital-wide quarterly meeting with all the upper management, including our CNO and CMO. When administering any type of medication, be sure that you are doing all of your checks and going through each of your patient's rights. Right patient, right medication, right dose, right time, right route, right documentation, um, and you've got to do this every single time you administer a medication. When delivering intravenous medications or solutions, continually assess the IV insertion site um, to ensure that there isn't signs of infection, signs of infiltration, phlebitis, etc. If there are any signs of infection, phlebitis, infiltration, you want to discontinue that IV site immediately and then establish a new IV site on the other arm, right? Uh, if possible. Um, be sure you have a clear understanding of your facility's procedures before transferring a patient. Before changing a dressing, be sure to check and follow the doctor's orders. Before applying external heat, be sure you have a doctor's order to do so. If policies and procedures do not get followed, patients get hurt. For example, a friend of mine shared that when she first started working in the hospital, many staff members were using hot water on maternity pads and putting them in cold packs to apply heat until a patient received a burn from this method. So education went out to all of the staff immediately to stop doing this method for heat. I too have witnessed medication dosage near misses within one, uh, with one of my peers who pulled way too much insulin up for a patient, right? Which could have could have killed the patient, right? Um, if she hadn't done her second check with another nurse, which was me, then that error um, would maybe not have been caught and that patient um, would have definitely died from hypoglycemic shock in this situation because the doses, uh, dosage was like 10 times stronger than it should have been. <clears throat> and it was a pretty good dose to begin with. Please remember to always do your six plus checks and rights and do not get careless at it is uh, very well could lead to patient harm and or death and then problematics for you, right? Uh, finally, always ask yourself, why is this nurse, um, why is a nurse like me doing something like this to a patient like that? If you know the answer, this, this will decrease the risks forever, right? Always know what you're doing, why you're doing it for that specific patient. That will definitely make your patient safer. Incidents, variance reports, and, occ and occurrence reports must be completed after any incident or accident in 
any facility that compromises your patient safety, right? This is where you're going to describe, uh, describe all of the different circumstances and um, things that led up to that incident or accident. You're going to definitely describe the patient's response um, to the accident as well as to the treatment of the patient after that incident. Um, we, the nurse, are the ones who complete the incident report immediately following the incident. And again, you're not going to put it in the patient's chart, but instead you're going to turn it into our risk, man risk management team. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Physiologic hazards associated with restraints. Okay, so this is why we do not use restraints it is the last mechanism that we go to. So again, we do not use them if we can all but help it because they do produce and increase the risk of a lot of things, right? So some of the physiological hazards associated with restraints include increased possibility of serious injury, increased risk of skin breakdown, increased risk of contractures, incontinence, depression, delirium, anxiety, aspiration, respiratory uh, difficulties, and even death. Alternative to restraints are always considered before applying a physical restraint. Where I work, we employ the, we employ the use of companions. This means someone sits with the patient 24 hours a day to keep them safe. And we do this before ever considering restraints. A doctor's order is required for any physical restraint um, as well as a medication restraint, right? So giving a patient a medication to keep them in bed and sedated is a restraint, okay? It is a restraint. So you cannot do that. With, um, you can't. So make sure that you are aware of that. Um, remember, restraints limits a person's movement and therefore can cause adverse effects, as mentioned on this slide. Nurses' assistants are key to restraint use as when a restraint is applied, increased skin assessments must be done and increased rounding must be done to ensure the patient is offered something to drink or eat and use of the restroom hourly. It's also important to mention that drugs that are used to control behavior are not included in the patient's normal medical regimen can be considered chemical restraints. We just mentioned that, right? So giving a patient a drug to knock them out is considered a chemical, uh, chemical restraint. Um, again, your book has really good examples of when to choose to use restraints and definitely when not to, so you might want to take a look at that. And finally, just please remember, restraints are the absolute last solution used with patients, and you have to have a doctor's order before you can ever put them on, okay? Okay, type of restraints used for adults uh, versus children. So this is on this slide. When necessary, we do use the soft wrist restraints. Um, these are tied around the wrists and ankles, and then they're secured to the bed frame. Another type of restraint you, we use in the hospital is called a veil bed. This bed completely encloses the patient with mesh sides, kind of like a tent, um, and then access to this restraint is zipped and secured from the outside. So only the staff can really unzip and get access to the patient, right? Uh, patients, families, and or caregivers must be notified of restraint use, right, before. A doctor's order, again, must be obtained before. And then a physician must see the patient face-to-face -face within 24 hours to evaluate the use of that restraint. And honestly, to look back and actually see was the restraint genuinely needed 24 hours ago, right? So they're going to be assessing whether or not you ordered restraints was actually a valid order. And if it's not, then as you can guess, you're probably going to get in some trouble, right? Again, remember, any restraint comes with increased rounding to maintain skin integrity, circulation, to ensure the patient's offered water and food, and to ensure that they're offered the ability to go to the restrooms, right? Um, and, and also, when patients are on restraints, you must be documenting um, every time you round. So it, it, it adds, you know, you have hourly rounding, which adds hourly charting, and I'm talking detailed hourly charting. So... Um, Again, just really only use it in last ditch efforts. And finally, we will be demonstrating how to apply restraints in the lab. Um, and then you're also going to get to practice this on each other. Um, 
As nurses, we are always concerned with emergency preparedness, right? Something on our minds all the time. As a nurse, you may be called to be a member of an emergency response team. I am registered with the Arizona Department of Health Services. Um, with the, I'm registered with Arizona's emergency system, and it's the advanced registration to for us healthcare professionals to volunteer our time to respond for emergency needs, right? Um, I haven't yet had to serve though, because during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, they did call upon me. Um, you know, it came through my phone via text of the locations and dates that they needed help. And I called them three times during the pandemic. However, I was unable to do it uh, due to our own pandemic and crisis happening here at our facility. They needed me to stay. So that's basically what I told them. Um, I did, though, help them out with the um, COVID clinics when, when they were having them at the state fair. I helped out several days for that. So that is one thing I was able to help with. Um, other resources for emergency preparedness are FEMA, right, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as the American Red Cross, right? Both of them have classes for healthcare professionals to help educators. Biological threats are deliberately spreading of pathogenic organisms to cause widespread illness. Chemical threats can be triggered by the deliberate or even unintentional release of chemical compounds that endangers people's health. Radiation threats involve intentional introduction of radioactive material into the environment to cause injury or death. Cyber terror uses high technology to disable or delete critical infrastructure data or information. All healthcare facilities should have plans with regards to how to deliver care in an emergency or disaster. These plans involve collaboration with internal and external organizations and resources throughout the area. The results of a disaster can affect each person differently. Remember that, right? Everybody responds differently. Part of the emergency preparedness, education and planning includes addressing mental health issues, including PTSD, as you can imagine, right? We saw a lot of that uh, post COVID, some PTSD. <clears throat> chemicals used for mass destruction. Okay, chemicals that can be used for mass destruction are listed on these two slides. Biotoxins are poisons from plants or animals. Blister agents or vesicants are chemicals that severely blister the eyes, the respiratory tract, um, and the skin on contact. Blood agents are poisons that are absorbed into the blood. Choking lung and pulmonary agents are chemicals that cause severe irritation or swelling of the respiratory tract. Incapacitating agents are drugs that affect the ability to think clearly or that cause an altered state of consciousness or even unconsciousness. Long acting anticoagulants are poisons that cause bleeding by preventing the blood to clot properly, right? So it affects the platelet in the blood. Each hospital has a de decontamination area to address these different types of threats as immediate decontamination is crucial um, because chemical agents can act very rapidly. So we have to have these decontamination, decontamination units all over the place, right? Because if we didn't have these decontamination units all over the place, if a patient had, uh, if an employee or a patient had to wait to get to the hospital to be treated for, you know, the chemical um, mass destruction, then it may be too late. They could be dead by then, right? Again, this is a continuation of the chemicals used for mass destruction, right? Um, again, metals are agents that consist of metallic poisons. Nerve agents are highly poisonous chemicals that prevent the nervous system from working properly. Organic solvents are agents that damage the skin by dissolving fats and oils. Riot control, like tear gas, are highly irritant agents normally used by law enforcement for crowd control or by individuals for protection. Toxic alcohols are poisonous alcohols that can damage the heart, kidneys, as well as your nervous system. Vomiting agents are chemicals that cause severe nausea and vomiting. 
All right, that's it. This is the end of the chapter on safety, security, and emergency preparedness. Again, you'll want to listen to this PowerPoint at least twice and uh, take really good notes. Thank you, wonderful students. We'll see you in class.